Uh, this is a good list that I've put together, inspired by a couple of others and my own contribution, and I'd like to share this list with you. First, learning the power of purpose. A person who has purpose in their life, they have something to go for, some meaning. One writer described it, for some people it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession. But it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on us. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distractions, the distractions. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger it pulls. And here's the other great advantage if you have purpose for the future. It pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor month. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a, a year that goes backwards if you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties and things that come at you, you've got to have something on out there beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. So that's one of the great powers that will make a variable of you, and that is purpose. Here's the next one, self-confidence. Where does self-confidence come from? And this is the best advice I can give you on that. Not neglecting, first of all, the small daily disciplines. Self-confidence really comes from feeling good about yourself. And one of the best ways to feel good about yourself is at the end of the day to know that you poured it on. You did your best. If you conducted a meeting, you did the best you could. If you made a phone call, it was the best phone call you could possibly make. If you wrote a letter, it wasn't a casual letter, it was your best letter. At the end of those kind of days, when you feel good about yourself, self-confidence starts to rise. You know that if you can have this kind of a good day, you can have another one the next day, and those days become the weeks, the weeks become the months, and the month becomes a powerful year. Self-confidence comes from the lack of neglect. If you will not neglect to do the small daily disciplines, that's where self-confidence comes from. Part of good health is self-confidence. I know I'm going to be healthy. I take the Herbalife products. I eat the apple a day. I walk around the block. I do the jogging on the beach. At the end of the day, when you've really poured it on and you've done all the stuff, self-confidence grows. That self-confidence affects your health, it affects your future, it affects your psyche. So this is true. One of the great powers is self-confidence. Self-confidence means willingness to do whatever it takes to achieve. Some people say, well, I'll do it for a little while and see what happens. You know, I'll try a couple of things. If that doesn't work, I'm out of here. And all of us know that that kind of person doesn't have much of a future. But if you're willing to do whatever it takes, if I have to learn a couple of things, I will learn those things. If I got to learn five or six things, I'll learn all six. If I have to take an extra class, I'll take an extra class. If I've got to read the books, I'll read the books. If I have to consult with people who know more than I know, I will do the necessary consulting. Whatever it takes, I will do. That starts to develop unbelievable self-confidence. Self-confidence also comes from the ability to rise above your circumstances, to rise above what happens, the petty little things. 
the discouraging things that would sink everyone else's ship except yours, that would cause someone else to quit early in the day, but you keep going. That kind of willingness to overcome all circumstances, whether it's the little challenges or the big challenges, if you're willing to do that, I promise you, this kind of power will work for you, and in you, the variable, it'll make a difference. The third on the list I had was enthusiasm. And here's what I wrote about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm that's powerful is mostly enthusiasm that is enthusiasm inside, 90%, 10% outside. We all know what the enthusiasm is like when somebody lets us see their enthusiasm, which is the, like the 90% and only 10% of it is inside. But the enthusiasm that really affects people is not just being loud, but the enthusiasm that runs deep, the enthusiasm that comes from deep inside, created by self-confidence, created by purpose, created by genuine willingness to help other people. That kind of enthusiasm, knowing that you're going to get the job done, knowing you're going to affect people, knowing you're going to have testimonials flowing in from all kinds of uh, directions, that kind of enthusiasm, a lot of it is quiet, a lot of it is unheard, and the 10% that's heard, it rings a bell. People call it genuine enthusiasm because they know that what you say in the outward display of your enthusiasm is only a small tip of the iceberg of the enthusiasm you feel inside that really motivates you to do the best job you can. Next on my list to help you become the powerful variable is expertise. Wanting to excel in all of the skills and settling for nothing less than an outstanding performance. If you're willing to be the best in your field, if you're willing to demand of yourself excellence in skills, to be the best that you can possibly be, in the training, do the best you possibly can. In doing a workshop, do the best you possibly can. Developing the skills of using your personality, developing the skills of language, developing the skills of influence, developing the skills of organizing. If you're willing to be an expert in all of the skills, Herbalife has the way for you to invest those skills and not only make a handsome living, not only make a lot of money, but if you would so desire and if it would be your purpose, a chance to make your fortune. Expertise, excellence in skills. Here was the next one on my list, making a powerful contribution to you, the variable, and that is preparation. Well prepared. And preparation, of course, involves a whole lot of things. A big share of our life is preparing, getting ready. When we go to the first grade in school, we're just preparing for the second grade. After we've finished two grades, the two grades prepare us for number three. Sometimes it seems like a long, excruciating time. And the time will just seem like it'll never come when we can finally have the performance that we really want. But it takes time to prepare. It takes time to get ready. And the decisions you make in the preparation time... Those are the decisions that last for a lifetime. Preparing to have a good day. It's that preparing, maybe the night before, maybe the couple of days before the day that you're going to put everything together. The preparation for a meeting means that you've taken it serious. The preparation for doing a workshop means you're serious about the workshop. You want to make the best contribution. That kind of preparation is important. But here's preparation that's very vital, and that is to prepare yourself for success. Life seemingly does not wish to waste success on the unprepared. Life says, why waste a fortune on this person? They're not prepared to do the right things with it. They're not prepared to use it wisely. If a fortune was bestowed upon this unprepared person, it would probably be wasted. The people that could have been touched won't be touched. What could have been done won't be done because this fortune will have been wasted on the unprepared person. 
So not only look for fortune, not only look for the promise, but prepare yourself and ask of yourself, what can I do to make myself ready? Because remember, life was designed not to give us what we want, not to give us what we need, but life was designed to give us what we deserve. Every value in life must be paid for. And those that pay are the ones that get it. It says those that give receive. Someone says, I wish to receive, I wish to receive. You don't have to concentrate on receiving. Just become a good giver. It says those that search will find. Someone says, well, I need to find some good ideas to help change my life for the future. Then to find good ideas, that doesn't come because you need them. It's because It comes because you search for them. If you want good ideas, you've got to go after them. You've got to go to the class. You've got to go to the workshop. You've got to go to the training. Go to the book, right? You've got to go to the journal, right? Go where good ideas are being taught. Go searching, go looking, because good ideas are not going to be wasted on those that are not seeking, searching, well prepared. So prepare yourself to be ready for fortune when it comes, to be ready for challenge when it comes, to be ready for opportunity when it comes. Opportunity comes along and passes by the person that is not well prepared. I want to prepare myself this year for next year. Yes, I wish to be effective this year, but I'm also thinking of ways. How could I be better? How could my ideas be more powerful? How could they be sharper, more clear? How could I reach some people uh, next year that I perhaps can't reach this year? I haven't reached deep enough into my own soul to affect some people. Some people just pass by and say, hey, what a good speech. But how could I make it stronger than that, deeper than that, more powerful than that? I cannot be as powerful as I could be next year. You know, you can't go to the, to the 10th grade and the 5th grade. You just got to go through the grades. But the more you are prepared, when the 10th grade finally comes, now you can cash in and get two times, three times, five times more value from it by being prepared. I want to do my best this year for Herbalife, but I also want to get ready for next year, 1999. And then when the year 2000 comes at the turn of the century, I want to be well equipped by language, by instinct, by temperament, by personality, by influence to really be valuable the year 2000. 2001, 2345. That's my goal. I'm sure it's your goal. Now, here's the next one. There's great power in self reliance. Self reliance means you simply look mostly to yourself. It would be nice if someone just gave you this, gave you this, gave you this. It would be nice if everyone did their job exactly as they're supposed to do it. But here's what you've got to do. Primarily rely on yourself. Primarily say, I'm the person responsible. And I will learn the necessary skills so that I can help people learn their skills. If I need lots of people to do certain things to build my organization, that is what I must have. But I've got to be the final backstop. I've got to be the final one that people can rely on. So that if this is missed and this is missed, I can catch up. I can fill the gap. I can do the job. We have to do it when we conduct meetings. We have to do it when we conduct training. We have to do it when we're in a class of just a few. What someone might have missed, we're there to fill in. Self-reliance. Primarily, we're learning to count on yourself so that you can do this. Never complain and never explain. Here's the next key power, and that's image. There's many parts to image. The image that others see you as, the image you have with other people. And it's very important how other people see you. If they don't see you as a leader, chances are they won't pay attention. If they don't see you as being in control, chances are they won't have the trust. If they don't see you as knowing where you're going, what you want to accomplish, they probably won't follow. But if people can see you, if you have the image of someone that's in charge, in control, in control of your 
life, your future, your destiny, in control of the situation, if they see that, that kind of image is powerful. It helps to win the day. It attracts other people. People want to be around people that are in control, that are powerful, but they know how to use their power. Influential, but they know how to use their influence. That kind of image is important. But here's a very important image, and that is your image of yourself. The way you dress, the way you talk, the way you think, your capacity for learning, all of that is an important image that you have of yourself. The image that you have that if it needs to be learned, you could learn it. If there's a book that needs to be mastered, you could master it. If there's a skill that needs to be learned, why couldn't you get busy now and learn that skill? That kind of self-image that I am continually trying my best to be the best I can. Because one of the most important places you have to look is into the future, yes. You've got to look into the past, yes. You've got to look around, yes. But one of the most important places you have to look is in the mirror. You know, how I appear to other people, that's important. But how I appear to myself is the ultimate importance. That kind of image to where you'll develop the self-confidence, you'll develop the self-reliance. Now here's another one in my rather short list. The next word is character. Becoming a person of high values, a person of principles, a person of honesty, a person that earns respect, that kind of character. It took character when Mark started to put the marketing system together. How can we have a system that will build in the integrity that people will know that if this happens, then this will happen? And if this goes wrong, here's the way to fix it. Unless you have the principles and the character and the integrity to put together a viable plan for a wide variety of people, then the system is not going to last very long. And I've been around long enough, and I'm sure you have been around long enough to see a lot of systems that got started, but they failed. And the reason is because they were not constructed with integrity. They were not constructed with character. They were not constructed with doing the right thing. They might have been constructed to take advantage, you know, cash it out as quickly as possible and leave. Mark was involved when others took advantage of him all those years ago before Herbalife. When someone took advantage and didn't have the character, didn't have the principles, and didn't have the, uh, the character to stay, the character to see it through, the character to do the right thing. So this is important to develop the character within yourself that people see you as honest, as fair, willing to do the right thing, willing to be helpful, but always willing to walk the center line not to pass the line. When we come to an opportunity like Herbalife, especially uh, multi-level network marketing, it is so dynamic, it is so powerful, and it is so possible in fortune making that sometimes people want to speed up the process by cutting the corners, by neglecting to do the right things, you know, to cheat a little here, cheat a little here, you know, cross the line just a little bit because then you know, it'll grow faster and you can cash in quicker. Not necessary here. Doing Herbalife right will build your fortune longer and stronger than trying to cut the corners and not doing it right. If, you'll ha if we'll have the integrity that Mark had when he started it and keep perpetuating that, that we will do the right thing by the marketing system, the right thing by uh, a distributor who has a customer and they take care of that customer, that customer belongs to that distributor, that kind of integrity in the marketing system, the kind of integrity we have among each other, the kind of character we have to rely on each other, because here's we, what we cannot do. We cannot do this by ourselves. Mark's got to count on me. I've got to count on Mark. We've got to count on the president's team. The president's team has to count on uh, the chairman's club for advice and counsel. Uh, we have to count on the millionaire team, the tabulator team, the world team. We've got to count on the distributor. We've got to count on the distributor giving the right message to the potential customer. 
We've got to count on the distributor giving wise counsel to the new recruit, teaching them the right way, the Herbalife way, the principled way, the character way. Vitally important. Building and developing your own character. Now here's another one. It's called self-discipline. Self-discipline, all of us have a challenge with that. Because sometimes it's easy, and especially if you're working hard, doing the best you can, it's easy sometimes to let up and let it go. But remember, so many people, especially now that we're as big as we are around the world, are counting on what we do. At home office, they have to be careful. They have to be disciplined. It's easy for the person who ships the product from Herbalife says, oh, well, I'll wait until tomorrow to ship it. And then they go home and sleep like a baby. But the distributor who's waiting for that product doesn't sleep that night or doesn't sleep when the product doesn't show on time. But if everybody will have the discipline to say, I will do the best job I can, I will make mistakes, of course, because we're all human, but I'll try to remedy those mistakes and do the best job I can. That kind of self-discipline that understands how important your part is in all of the functions that work. Coming to work on the set here, uh, HBN, there's so many people that play a part. And each one of the parts that are played is necessary to put on the broadcast, make it viable, make it real, make it powerful. Any couple of them missing, and it would be a disaster. But all of it put together, and it works like a charm. Each person developing the self discipline to do their part, do their job. Here's one more, and that is the power of extraordinary performance and demanding of yourself excellent results. This is so important. If you want to live extraordinary, you must do extraordinary. If you want an extraordinary income, you must do extraordinary things. If you want an extraordinary fortune, you must go with the demands of what it takes to have that fortune. Mark has made such a fortune, it's almost beyond comprehension what the numbers really are. But guess what he has the satisfaction of knowing? He earned it all. If he'd have been lax in the performance, Herbalife would not be here these 18 years later. Herbalife would have been a footnote in multi-level history. But because he performed year after year, the third year and the fifth year, and the seventh year and the tenth year, and the twelfth year and the fifteenth year, and now performing well in the eighteenth year, I'm telling you, that's what makes it such a viable fortune for Mark personally, of course, because he did the job. If we would ask of ourselves that kind of performance, and you've got to ask it of yourself, you know, I can't ask it of you. I would try to inspire you. I would tr try my best to share with you what it might taste like, what it's like to finally make your fortune. It happened for me. But here's what you must do. You must demand it of yourself. Society does not demand that you not have a heart attack. But if you want to escape having a heart attack, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you take herbal life and improve your health. You have to demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you jog around the block every morning. Uh, but if you want good health, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you read a couple of books a week and improve your intelligence and your knowledge. That you must demand of yourself. Society does not demand that you build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. That's not a demand of society. But you must demand it, if you wish it, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you learn a list of ten skills in order to ensure your own future and the future of your family. Society doesn't demand it, doesn't require it. It is not a law. But if you want the benefit, you must demand it of yourself. Autographs and Girl Scout cookies. I mean, I, I'm in the market. I really appreciate it. Everybody doing okay? Say, I'm okay. Does anybody have five pages of notes already? Okay, I'm sure you're filling up your book. I appreciate that. 
first let's talk about my my version of financial independence you've heard from brian you've heard you know some excellent advice dennis you know these guys are long time experienced and i'm sure you've got good notes on their presentation uh this little bit i you know designed long long time ago it's still valid today here's one of the major goals to go for financial independence Every American's, you know, right, privilege to become financially independent. So here's my definition of financial independence. The ability to live, and I'll give you time to write it down. The ability to live from the income. of your personally invested resources the ability to live from the income of your personally invested resources that's the simple definition that from the resources you've invested the income from those resources you could live here's one of the advantages of financial independence now you can work or not work or you can certainly choose the work to do now you can work by choice not by necessity and here's one of the best to be able to work for joy and not for necessity at first of course we have to work for necessity but if you can finally reach the point where you can work for joy, not for necessity. That happened for me all those years ago. My father kept talking about financial independence, debt free, no one having a claim on your assets, finally being able to live from the income of your invested resources. I remember the joyful day when that finally arrived. So what I've done now most of my life I've had the unique privilege of working for joy, not for necessity. Not that the joy doesn't bring you more, more income. Not that working, working for joy doesn't make you another fortune. It certainly has for me, right? Another fortune and another fortune and another fortune. But it, not because I had to, but because I wanted to. I work now for joy and not for necessity. Key phrase to understand. We should teach this to our children. Economics is major. Everyone has to major in economics. Number one, for personal survival. To produce enough to take care of yourself. The first, economics. The next good phrase on economics. It's not what you earn, it's what you do with what you earn that makes the great difference in your financial future. All of this is determined by your own philosophy. It's important early, and kids have to have a personal philosophy working even when they go to school. Here's a good definition of your personal philosophy. A guidance system. Your personal philosophy is a guidance system. And it does simply two things. Helps you to see the opportunities, take advantage of those. Helps you to see the dangers, minimize those. And as we learn and grow, we learn hopefully early to spot the dangers so they don't overcome us. We hopefully we learn early to see the opportunities and take advantage of those, maximize them if we can. That guidance system is like a sail on a sailboat. The winds are always blowing, favorable winds, unfavorable winds, stormy winds, economic winds, political winds. The wind is always blowing. But to arrive at a predetermined destination, 
It is not just the blowing of the wind that we have to deal with. Here's the major part, the set of the sail. The set of the sail is what you learn, gathering information from these three days. Talking to each other, gathering more information, filling up one journal, then another one. Information. Guidance on how to trim the sail, set the sail. The Sunday morning sermon, the lyrics of a song, the dialogue of the movie. Words put into good structure so that they deliver enlightenment, information, knowledge. And we use that to set sail. And it isn't that you set sail once and then that's it and it's over. It is a continual setting of sail every day, every month, every year. Setting sail economically, trimming the sail. For your good health, you just have to set sail toward the destination you wish to reach, having good health. Then it's easy to neglect, then it's easy to slide. Here's one of the better phrases. Everything by longevity tends to get off course. Everything by longevity tends to get off course. Whether it's a lecture like we've engaged in here, hours and hours and hours, or whether it's a simple sermon, one of the most classic sermons I ever heard originated not far from here in the Crystal Cathedral. I used to do little speeches for the positive thinkers breakfast meetings. the Crystal Cathedral, before it was the Crystal Cathedral. Little sessions they had in the morning, right, where you could attend and hear some speakers. I used to do some of those speeches, I don't know, 35 years ago, a long time ago. Possibility thinkers, breakfast is what it was. His son, uh, Schuler Jr., was giving a classic sermon one morning, and I was privileged to hear it. Here was the notes on his sermon. It's very brief, so I'll give it to you. So jot this down. These are great notes. Here was his sermon. Number one, if you think it's impossible, it isn't. That's number one. If you think it's impossible, it isn't. Here was point number two. If you think you know everything, you don't. Wow, that's good. Point number three, if you think you're alone, you're not. Isn't that a classic, that's a classic sermon. If you think it's impossible, it isn't. If you think you know everything, you don't. And if you think you're, you're alone, you're not. Now here was one of the spectacular stories in this little sermon. He told the story of Rich DeVos, who started the big uh, Amway Corporation. Rich DeVos is in bad shape. Rich needs a heart transplant. And if he doesn't get it, he's not going to last very long. Now, fast forward. Rich DeVos finally gets his heart transplant. And what was spectacular about the story was, after his heart transplant, he has dinner with the lady who gave him her heart. <laughs> he has dinner with the lady who gave him her heart. You say what? That's impossible. You couldn't have dinner with the person that gave you their heart. Here's what happened. This lady was desperately ill and needed a lung transplant. A donor was found. 
And sometimes it's much better in a lung transplant if the heart and the lung go together. So this lady gets the heart and the lung transplant that she needs to save her life. Now her heart is left over from this operation and her heart goes to Rich DeVos. That's how Rich was able to have dinner with the lady who gave him her heart. Isn't that a fantastic story? I love those simple little stories. One, two, three. A couple of illustrations. Wow. Just dramatic, dynamic. Anyway, where was I before I got off on these uh, stories? <laughs> your philosophy. Whether it's your philosophy about economics or your philosophy about marriage or your guidance system about good health, it's easy to get off track. So by longevity, we start and sure enough, it drifts off course. And that's what sermons are for. And that's what the lyrics of the songs are for in personal conversation, is to get us what? Back on track. Back on track. And hopefully we're not too far off track so that it doesn't take too long to get back on track. So maybe that's all you needed this weekend. You're doing pretty good, but in a few things, you've drifted a little to the right or you've drifted a little to the left or, or just by you know a casual approach to some things instead of the serious approach you know you're a little bit off track and it doesn't take that long if it hasn't gone on too long to get back on track back on track but even if it's been a long time you can start the process overnight you can start the process decision making this weekend could be some of the most important of your life and your future not because we have given the seminars, but because the moment was right for you. And somehow it was said okay, and somehow it was delivered with sincerity, and you got the message, and this weekend makes a pivotal turn for you in terms of the set of the sale. Okay, your philosophy. Now, your philosophy about money. Someone mentioned the other day, the love of money. What about money? What about success? It's a good debate. I've got a good question. And it's a bit... It's not necessarily a high moral question, but it's a pretty good question. If you could do better, should you? That's not a bad question. Now, all of us have personal choice, but... This is a good question, and a lot of my stuff is up for debate. You know, I don't even claim to be right. If you take all these notes and throw them away and go listen to somebody else, I'll be just as happy. Because, you know, it doesn't matter. As long as you finally, right, get the ideas that make a difference for you and add to the wealth and the structure of your own life systems, that's what's important. Not that I deliver the message that's all important. But piece by piece, and speaker by speaker, and teacher by teacher, and phrase by phrase, and book by book, we pick up the information that helps us to fine-tune our life and our future. But this is a good one for your own debate. If you could do better, should you? That's a good one. Now, let's talk about financial independence. When I meet Mr. Shoff, I'm not in good shape. Here's where I was when I met him. Pennies in my pocket and nothing in the bank. Because the story of the Girl Scout with the cookies had just occurred in my life. And now I meet this man. Here's what he said. Now to get started in a whole new direction, here's what you need to do. You need to develop a financial statement. So just make a little note on your notes there. If you haven't ever done it, this is not a bad place to start. A financial statement. And a financial statement is very simple. It's a piece of paper with a line down the middle. On this side is the value of all your assets. And over here is all of your liabilities. Here's what you've got in terms of worth. And here's what you owe. 
And then when you add up all of the value of your assets and you add up all that you owe called liabilities, we come up with what we call now, finally, when you subtract one from the other, your current net worth. Now, this is not your net worth as a father. This is not your net worth as a parent. This is not your net worth as a friend. There's all kinds of worth and value. But if you really want your economics to go better, here's a good place to start. Key phrase, take a picture of where you are. And here's what it's called, the truth. <laughs> now, you don't have to publish this in some local newspaper, right? This is all private stuff. But there's, you, you have to say, you know, finally, there's no use kidding myself. I got to take a picture of where I am. I got to know how good it is or I got to know what? I got to know how bad it is. I got to know how much I'm on the upside or how deep a hole am I really in. So this is what I started. It was a simple little program of coming up with my current net worth. My liabilities, that was easy. I owed my parents. I owed, I owed, I owed. I made the third uh, borrowing on my car and he was threatening to come and get it, drag it down the road, rear end up in front of my neighbors. So I had plenty of liabilities. On the asset side, I am really, I put my furniture even. I, I put everything I could think of. My shoes, I mean, wouldn't the Salvation Army give me two dollars for my shoes? I mean, I am scrambling. And when I did this exercise, guess what it did? It really soberly gave me a current picture of where I was. And guess what? I was unhappy. But here's what's important about the truth. It sets you free. Number one, free to correct old errors in judgment. That's what the truth is for. To correct old errors. After six years, I started working when I was 19. And when I took a picture of where I was, it was not a very happy experience. So now, where do we go from here? In putting together a financial statement, realizing exactly where we are, no nonsense, this is the real deal. We don't have to share it with anybody, but we do need to know the truth for ourselves. Now here's what we need. Number one, perhaps, a new philosophy. Let me give you sort of the simple philosophy of the rich and the poor. Here's the philosophy usually of the rich and the poor. Poor people spend their money and invest what's left. <coughs> Brian talked a little bit about that and there's usually what? Not much left. Here's usually the philosophy of the rich. The rich invest their money and spend what's left. It's just a little turn of semantics. But the little turn of semantics is like the turn of the set of the sail that takes you in a whole different direction to a wind up at a good place in one year or a place, you know, of average, mundane, where you don't really want to be. Just that little simple shift of philosophy. So here's the key. Think like the rich. Invest your money first, then spend what's left. Don't spend your money and invest what's left. Now the whole key is lifestyle, and, and Brian touched a little bit on that. When I gave this little class one time at a school class, the teacher said, you know, you must not you know, promise people that with a little bit of investment every month that they can, you know, make their fortune because people nowadays are overloaded, they're spending everything they make, you know, their standard of living is right up there. And I said, well, that's, this is where it all begins. I said, could we think of someone, and this was a long time ago, of course, that makes $2,000 a month. She said, yes, no problem. We can probably find someone that makes $2,000 a month. What would this couple, this family tell you it takes to pay all the bills and just keep their head above water? And she said, well, 2000 I said, could we possibly find somebody not far from here that makes $2,500 a month, right? Maybe even both working combined. $2,500 a month, $500 a month more. 
would this family say it probably takes to pay all the bills and keep your head above water? What would they say? Right? 2500 So I said to her, what happened to this $500? How did it disappear? Wisely invested over some reasonable period of time, the return is unbelievable. And she said, I never thought about that. So jot this down. The money is always there, either to spend or invest. The difference in what you do with it is based on philosophy, not economy. It isn't the state of America's economy that makes the difference. It's the difference in your philosophy. Right? That illustration? Here's a book on how to get rich. It costs $20. Somebody says, well, a poor person can't buy that book. Say, no, it's only seven Coca-Colas. And you either spend the money on the seven Coca-Colas or a $20 book that teaches how to get rich. So jot this down. Everybody has the money. Even the poorest of the poor. The key is how to spend it. The key is what to spend it for. And how you spend it. First, how you earn it is determined by your philosophy. Second, now, how you spend it is determined also by your personal philosophy. So what would be a good philosophy to follow? And this is the little simple form I want to give you on financial independence. Wealth for the future. It won't take long now to jot this down. It takes a little longer to go do it, but here it is. What to do with a dollar. If a child asks what to do with a dollar, here's my suggestion. Never spend more than 70 cents. 70 cents. You've got to pick some number. Right? This is the number I've picked. Right? Listen to Brian, listen to Dennis, listen to me, and then refine your own to suit you. But I suggest don't spend more than 70 cents. Here's where the other 30 cents goes. 10 cents, 10% 10 of your income for charity, church, whatever, supporting worthy projects, teaching children here to become generous. If kids understand generosity, they'll give you 10 cents out of every dollar that they earn. And this is a good place to start. It's easy to give 10 cents out of a dollar. A little more difficult to give a hundred thousand out of a million. You say, oh, if I had a million dollars, I'd give a hundred thousand. I'm not that sure. <laughs> we better start you early, right? So that when the big money comes, it'll just be automatic. You won't even have to think about it. Okay. All right. So ten cents for charity and church. Here's the next ten cents. Active capital. Try to make a profit. It's called buy and sell. I learned to do this starting at age 25. It's how I made my first fortune. Buying and selling. Like the little boy who buys a bottle of soap for $2 and sells it for 3 Active capital means you try to make the profit. Buy a piece of property and improve it and sell it. Active capital. Keep saving up this active capital until you've got some to work with, to buy and sell, make a profit. Now the third 10 cents is passive capital. Which means let somebody else use this 10%. You put this to work and see if you can't make a profit. This is to let someone else use it. You are the passive partner in providing the money. They are the active partner in seeing if they can make a profit and pay you dividends and stock increase and, and uh, whatever. Interest. And that little formula is a good place to start. Now you might not really be able to start there. I call this the ideal. Maybe by the time you've heard this, you're in such bad financial shape that you have to go here, 97, 1, 1, and 1. That right now you're in a trap. You're caught. And it's going to take 
take you a while to get out. So right now you got to spend 97 percent of your income right for your living and lifestyle because you know you're caught you're obligated you know there's no way out and then the rest of these now are just one one and one the key is to start with something now mr shelf gave me a comment it has served me all these years here's the comment it's not the amount that counts it's the plan that counts <coughs> When I first met him, I said, if I had more money, I'd have a better plan. He said, no, if you had a better plan, you'd have more money. So if you have to, you start with 97, 1, 1, and 1. Then what do you do? Now comes the project, right away, of trying to get this 97 figure to go down and these other three numbers to start going up. This now becomes an exciting game to play. In another seminar, I talk about measuring progress. This is, this is one of the great motivating factors in the world, is to start something and make progress. Start something and make progress. So Jim Rohn told us the ideal was 70, 10, 10, and 10. But I can't start there. I've got to start with 97, 1, 1, and 1. And here's what you've got to understand. This is okay. I mean, if this is where you have to start, that's where you have to start. Then you start driving this number down down and start driving these numbers up and it's a whole game to play till finally you can arrive at this pretty good ideal way what to do with the money you earn from a paycheck or from dividends or from whatever sources 70 10 10 10 I mentioned the name Sarah Alfaro in Mexico I taught her this and she's been teaching it to the people uh, she's responsible for over, over all the last 10 years and some of them now are doing extremely well making big money and they've got houses and cars and you know all kinds of stuff 70 10 10 and 10 now when you start getting into the big money these numbers have to change again I probably don't spend more than 10 percent of my income so if, I, if this number for me is 10%, you can imagine what these other three numbers probably are. So if you have to, you start here. Get to the ideal. And then when it really starts to flow in your favor, you rearrange this program again, 10%. Because if you're doing big time, you, know, you couldn't spend... 70% of your income, it would be obscene. <laughs> so, just a little formula to follow. Now here's the wrap-up, and I've got to get to a few points on leadership before we finish. Here's the next one now. This is only a suggested plan. You know, this is not written in any law. You know, most advantages and benefits for the future are not written in law. There's no law that says you must not have a heart attack. Where is it written? There is no law. That you must demand of yourself. There is no demand that you have a good financial plan that will safely take care of your family for the future. There is no law. You could be careless and lose it all and finally have to be supported by the state. So there is no law that you must be responsible and have a good financial plan. You must demand it of yourself. So I'm asking you to make that note. It's what we demand of ourselves that counts. There's no law that says you must have a health plan that's going to make you extremely healthy for the next 10 years. There is no law. That you must demand of yourself. And those are the disciplines now that really start to count. The ones you demand of yourself. So, next, keep strict accounts. Keep strict accounts. Have you ever heard this expression? I don't know where it all goes. Did you ever hear that? Oh, we'd love to have you run our company. You don't know where it all goes. 
Did you ever hear this? It just gets away from me. Oh, we'd love to have you run the world. It just gets away from you? Okay. Will you make the note now? Keep strict accounts. This is for your own self-esteem, as well as safety and financial matters for the future. Keep strict accounts. You've got to do it, you know, for the IRS. You've got to do it for the tax uh, bill that comes due. Then there's one more. Be happy to pay your taxes. <laughs> and this is an assignment that's one of the toughest. I'm trying to finish this book I've been working on for so long. Hopefully I'll get it done one of these days. And the title is, Of Course Kids Should Pay Taxes. And it's a little book on really everybody should pay taxes. And then you need to know why. In California, if a 10-year-old walks into 7-Eleven and buys something that costs a dollar, the proprietor asks the child for eight more pennies. Does the child have a right to know how come we're asking him for eight more pennies? And the answer is yes. The kid says, I'm only 10 years old. And the proprietor says, congratulations, you're my youngest taxpayer. <laughs> now the kid wants to know, who gets these eight pennies? Where does it go? And here's what the proprietor, if he's wise, says. Well, if you want to ride your bicycle on the sidewalk instead of in the mud, you have to pay the eight pennies. Everybody pays the eight pennies on every dollar so that we have streets and we have a sidewalk so you don't have to ride your bicycle in the dirt and the mud, you got the sidewalk. And now the child understands, okay, here's my eight pennies. So jot this down now. Everybody has to pay. We can't let anybody off the hook because all of us are in this together. And you can't build your own section of the street out in front of your home. What kind of equipment would you need to build your own piece of the street out in front of your house? No, you can't do that. So we take these collective needs that all of us need and we ante up the money, whether it's federal or state or sales tax or whatever it is, so that all of this is taken care of us. Here's what it's called, the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. You say, well, the goose eats too much. That's probably true. <laughs> but make this note, better a fat goose than no goose at all. So everybody has to pay. How much do you think aircraft carriers cost? We can't use used missiles. <laughs> Here's where else the money goes. So you'll be safe in your bed at night while the policeman walks the beat. While we sleep, the Air Force doesn't sleep. While we sleep, the Army doesn't sleep. While we sleep, the policeman walks the beat and checks the doors. That's where the money goes. Once you have a vision of where the money goes, yes, for some things it costs too much. Yes, the government sometimes is too extravagant. Yes, yes, all the yeses. But all those yeses are true for all of us. Sure, the goose might eat too much, but who doesn't? <laughs> Should we have confession time here today? <laughs> No, no, no. Please let me off the hook. So you got to do the same with the government. Yes, the government needs to go on a diet and slim down and not spend quite so much. That's also true. But it's true of what? All of us. This is the deal. We're in all of this thing together. So finally, when I understood what this was all about, I finally became a very strange creature called a happy taxpayer. <laughs> That's it. Now, should everybody pay? Let me give you one good illustration that comes from the Bible and I'm finished. Jesus one day, and I'm an amateur on the Bible, but here's a classic story. The storyteller says, Jesus one day was out in front of the synagogue watching people come in. And with him were his disciples. 
So Jesus and his disciples are watching people come in to the synagogue. And the custom was before they came into the synagogue, they deposited a contribution. They deposited the contribution, went on into the church. The story says some came with large contributions and went in. Some came with small contributions and went in. And as the disciples and Jesus watched, a little lady came along and she put two pennies in the treasury and walked in. And Jesus said, look at that. And his disciples said, two pennies, two pennies, what's two pennies? He said, no, you don't understand. She gave more than everybody else. They said, two pennies is more than everybody else? He said, yes, because I'm sure that two pennies represented almost all of what she had. So since her two pennies represented almost all of what she had, she gave the most. What a classic philosophy. Now here's what did not occur. I'm so brilliant, I can give you what the storyteller left out. <laughs> here's what did not occur in this little scene. When the little lady put her two pennies in the treasury, uh, Jesus and his disciples did not run after her and say, hey, hold it, hold it, little lady. Uh, hold it, little lady. Uh, we've observed what's happened with putting the two pennies in the treasury and we've decided that uh, you're so pitiful and you're so poor that we've decided to give you back your two pennies. I'm here to tell you that did not occur. So make this note from this little story. Jesus left her two pennies in the treasury even though it was most of what she had. Wow. That's such a classic lesson in philosophy. That's such a classic lesson in what all of us are involved in, in making contributions. Shouldn't everybody wish to pay? The government has decided to leave some people that they consider poor and pitiful off the tax rolls. See, that's unthinkable. Shouldn't they, even if they only pay the dollar, so that they can be able to say what? I pay. I make my contribution. No matter how poor I am, if all I've got is pennies, I give some as contribution. Whether it's taxes or whether it's benevolence or whatever it is. Okay, isn't that a great story? It's a good story. Then another one that really help me help me secure a fortune and fortunes after here it is learn to help people not just with their jobs but with their lives I learned early in my accelerated business career to teach life skills as well as business skills work skills and job skills because guess what we need both work skills and life skills Here's the last one. It's a promise from the Bible. Here's what it says. If you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. If you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. They'll make a place for you. You'll be invited to some extraordinary places if you keep working on your gifts. Make yourself valuable. Make yourself attractive. Make yourself unique. Become a person who has plenty to give and plenty to share, whether it's ideas or money or treasure or time. If you will work on that, you'll have places. Look where my gifts have brought me from the farm country of Idaho to this magnificent place to serve and share ideas, my experiences, hopefully that will make a difference. And last, when I'm gone, people always ask, what would you like said after you're gone? And I came up with something the other day. It was pretty simple. Here it is. Jim Rohn made a major contribution to someone. Jim Rohn made a major contribution to someone. 
and then another one, and another one, and another one. Wow. And that journey continues for me. So if you've got my name on your notes, which hopefully I'm sure you have, when we leave here, I go with you, these notes and all the experience that we've had. But I promise you this, as we leave here, I will not leave you behind. I'll take you with me in my thoughts and in my heart. Thank you very much. God bless.